Many prolific serial killers have stalked the United States, but, few as disturbing, as Robert Lee Yates, the Spokane, serial killer. Unlike many other murderers, Yates flew under the radar, because he looked so normal. He killed more than a dozen women in the 1990s, and 2000s. He committed blatant murders, as mere target practice in 1975. No, these crimes committed by Robert Yates are not easy to stomach. He's got a twisted story, of death, callousness, and even necrophilia. In the early hours of April 18, 2000, Robert Yates, 47, a married father of five, was arrested for the murder of Jennifer, Joseph, 16. As Yates sat in the police station waiting for a jail term, police threw Yates into the middle of the maze, for a second time. Once the trap had been closed, around the serial killer's confinement, a task force was organized to track him down. In the days following the women's disappearance, witnesses described seeing Yates' white 1977 Corvette in the area. Yates was interrogated, and detectives found enough evidence to arrest him, in Jennifer Joseph's death. For the two days preceding Yates' arrest, detectives conducted round-the-clock surveillance of him. After returning from a two-week Army National Guard camp, as Spokane's serial killer committed more crimes, he seems to have grown bolder. As a first trick in separating himself from the crimes, he resorted to time and distance. He was very smart, but over time, the gunman grew more confident, even dumped his victims in public places. In the early stages of the investigation, victims were found miles from where they worked. Yates would shoot his victims in the head with a .25 caliber gun, after covering their heads with some plastic grocery bags. Now, when you think about the bags, they were a signature, something serial killers do that is unnecessary for murder. In the aftermath, he would dump the bodies in remote locations, but very near traveled roads and close to each other. Almost all victims were likely killed elsewhere before being transported to dumping sites where they were found. On October 26, 2000, after a series of appalling plea bargains, Yates was finally sentenced to 408 years in prison, for 13 murders. Yates has since been transferred to Pierce County. But that's not it because Yates may face the death penalty in Tacoma, in the deaths of Melinda Mercer, and Connie LaFontaine Ellis. And he is still a suspect in many other murders, as detectives found blood in his vehicles, that don't match any known victims. And also law officers in Germany are investigating whether Yates might be involved in the deaths of 26 women in the country. In early 1966, Georgina Yates, a 16-year-old girl, was raped by an unidentified man who was apparently never caught, resulting in her pregnancy with Yates who was born in February 1967. Despite her successful delivery, Georgina died due to hemorrhaging. Yates was therefore was under the care of his maternal grandparents, Trudy and Roy. Trudy, who believed that Yates was a demon bastard, by his conception and birth, subjected him to physical and psychological abuse. They pushed him down the stairs, forced him to put on a dress, and then locked him outside the house. They starved him, sat on him, and made him sleep in a doghouse. Growing up in Oak Harbor, Washington, as a child, Yates was also bullied at school, and he was expelled from two different schools. When he was 15 years old, the bully became enraged, and he ended up stabbing, and kicking his tormentor to death. As a juvenile, he was sentenced to three years in juvenile hall, plus seven additional years in prison before being released on parole. Yates, as an adult, became a chain smoker and worked as a day laborer in an unspecified job. For nearly two decades, Robert served as an army helicopter pilot. In the early 1970s, Yates dropped out of college and joined the army on October 4, 1977. In less than three years, Yates was a warrant officer attending flight school at Fort Rucker, Alabama, the home of Army aviation. 
graduated with a pair of helicopter pilot wings, and now he is authorized to fly helicopters. He flew a Belgian Ranger helicopter, the military version of the OH-58 Kiowa. In the height of Cold War tensions between Western Europe and the former Warsaw Pact, Yates was stationed in Germany. His decorations included three Meritorious Service Medals, three Army Commendation Medals, three Army Achievement Medals, and a Humanitarian Service Medal. These were awarded for participating in a relief mission to South Florida, to help clean up the devastation left by Hurricane Andrew in 1992. Also, he was awarded two Armed Forces Expeditionary Medals, one for his involvement in peacekeeping missions in Somalia in 1993, and in Haiti during Operation Uphold Democracy in 1994. Yates was always a true professional. Clearly, it is sad that he would go out here, and hunt the enemy without any weapons. When he retired, Yates held the rank of Chief Warrant Officer for the highest position a warrant officer could keep in the army. So with more than 5,000 hours of flight time in helicopters without a single accident, he had achieved the rank of Master Army Aviator. A career military aviator for 18 years, Yates was close to reaching the coveted 20-year mark, when service members are entitled to retirement benefits. Yates instead retired from the army in March 1996. He settled into a beige two-story rancher on Spokane's South Hill, as a civilian again with his family. Yet, within months of his retirement, Yates was looking forward to returning to the cockpit. And in the face, his request was granted by the Washington Army National Guard in April 1997. Yates, however, was unable to fly. A performance evaluation report noted that, despite his inability to fly due to a medical delay, he remained dedicated, and continued to perform well. When Chief Warrant Officer Yates was grounded, detectives worked to solve the mystery surrounding an increasing number of bodies discovered throughout Washington state. Since late summer 1997, seven women have been murdered in Spokane, four of whom were murdered during the year's final weeks. This realization made public officials and law enforcement officials worried that Spokane had become the new killing grounds for the elusive Green River Killer. Despite many bodies being found and many victims being prostitutes, there was only talk and speculation. Only a marked difference in the killer's method of operation quelled speculation and talk. Even so, it was a possibility, at least initially, given that serial killers have occasionally changed their tactics. Disturbingly, the number of bodies would more than double before the killer stopped, and many more would be linked to him. This eastern Washington city, was first targeted by a serial killer. On February 22, 1990, at approximately 8.30 a.m., homicide detectives responded to a report of a young black female, lying nude over an embankment, near the Spokane River. Initially, detectives observed that the young woman had been shot multiple times in the head, and struck by a small caliber gun. A thorough search of the area showed no clothing or personal effects on the victim. Neither bullets nor shell casings were found, indicating that the killer cleaned up after himself, killed the victim at a different location, and then transported the body. Yolanda Sapp, 26 has been identified as the victim after some details of the discovery of her body became public. Investigators soon found out that Sapp used drugs and had a history of prostitution arrests. So they took a hair sample during the autopsy, as was an oral, anal, and vaginal swab. While they are doing their work, another body turned up a little over a month later. A body was found in the road shortly after 6 a.m. A white female was shot to death. The victim was eventually identified as Nikki Lowe, a 34-year-old prostitute and drug addict. She had a .22 caliber bullet recovered from her head, and her body smelled strongly of oil. Even though detectives investigating the murders of Yolanda and Nikki were pretty confident that both women were murdered by the same killer, little progress was made in the investigation over the next seven weeks and no other bodies were found either, leaving investigators wondering whether the killer had moved to another area, or hiding out. 
Fortunately, they were not left in the dark for too long. On May 15, 1990, the Sheriff's Department received a report about a body found near the Spokane River banks in the Trent Pines area. The victim was a white female, who was nude except for a few rings on her fingers. She also had contusions on her head, so investigators believe she was beaten. She was identified as Kathleen Brisbois, 38. Kathleen also had bullets recovered from her head. And traces such as hair and fibers were sent to the state crime lab. Three females, same autopsy results and all believed to be related to prostitution. So, investigators have no doubt by now that they are dealing with a serial killer. As many things were hidden, they had no idea when, or where he'd strike next. Until then, they weren't close to identifying the killer, and everyone realized, he could leave a lot of bodies in his wake before getting caught. More than two years have passed, without any additional victims being found related to the Spokane serial killer. In fact, investigators opted for the idea that the killer might have been killing women in another location during the two-year interval. Until Wednesday, May 13, 1992, a naked female body was found on Bill Gulch Road. A plastic bag covered the victim's head, and pieces of clothing were tangled around her arms. A bullet was found near the body, but no shell casings were recovered. And as there was no sign of a struggle, and no blood pooling, cops determined the victim had been killed somewhere else, then brought here. As with the others, gunshot wounds were determined to cause death. Again, bullets, hair, fiber, and orifice swabs were taken from the victim's body. Fingerprint analysis identified the Caucasian victim as, 19-year-old Sherry Palmer. Palmer also had a history of prostitution. It took more than three years, before the next Spokane serial killer victim was found. As of this point, Spokane investigators were contacting their colleagues in other locales to find anything that linked victims to a suspect. Sadly, all they had were prostitution victims who had been killed similarly by gunshot with a small caliber weapon, and whose bodies had been dumped. Now that the Spokane serial killer's latest victim in Kitsap County had been linked to him, he clearly targeted different regions. It was also a sign that the Green River killer might still be active, that the latest victim was found in western Washington. In Kitsap County, the nude body of 60-year-old Patricia Barnes was found on August 25, 1995. Cops arrived to find a body partially covered with cut foliage. Barnes, the oldest victim of the Spokane serial killer, was a street person without links to prostitution or illicit drugs. 2.22 caliber bullets were also found in her body. Due to the evidence recovered, the victim's lifestyle, the victim's ballistics, and how Barnes' nude body was found. In comparing Barnes' background with that of the Spokane victims, it was clear they were searching for the same killer. A similar horror was resurfacing in Spokane, Washington, ten months after the Kitsap County case. Shannon Zielinski, 39, was found decomposed near Spokane Park Drive, on June 14, 1996. Zelinksy was clad in a short grey dress, unlike prior victims who were all naked. Several items were found nearby, including a towel draped over her torso, and one tall black boot. The shell casing was found at the scene, and, like the others, there was little blood pooling, suggesting that she had been killed elsewhere. She was also shot to death. Investigator Hill discovered that Zelinsky had a history of prostitution and drug use. And sadly, toxicology tests were impossible due to the decomposition of her body. Spokane detectives had a busy day on Tuesday, August 26, 1997, when it was more than a year after Zielinski's body was found, when two more bodies were found. It was that of 20-year-old Heather Hernandez, a well-known prostitute. The decomposing remains of Hernandez were found in a field wearing only a shirt and a bra. She had been killed by two shots in the head. In another location of Spokane, investigating the discovery of the body of an Asian female in Forker Road. It was later determined, that the body belonged to a 16-year-old girl, named, Jennifer Joseph. 
an investigator from the crime scene found a light blue towel, and a used condom. Like all others, investigation indicates she was killed elsewhere and then transported here. There were multiple gunshot wounds to the body. Three small stud-type earrings had pale stones in her left ear during her autopsy. Still, there were only two in her right ear, indicating that one of the earrings was dropped when her killer assaulted her. Also, one false eyelash had disappeared from the victim's body, so it likely came off during the encounter with the killer. The police found out that another prostitute working with her in the East Sprague area last saw Joseph alive at 11.35 p.m. on August 16. The prostitute last saw Joseph traveling eastbound on Thor in the company of a white male, approximately 30 to 40 years old, in a car believed to have been a white Corvette. In the end, it turned out that the car would be the first actual link in the case that tied any of the victims to a suspect that could be identified. At the time, undercover officers were in the places where prostitutes were known. When a police officer came into contact with 45-year-old Robert Yates. Yates, driving a 1977 white Corvette, was pulled over for a minor traffic infraction on September 24, 1997. He was cited and allowed to proceed. Yet, since the patrolman had written in his report, Yates drove a Camaro and had not noticed Yates' Corvette, and the murder of Jennifer Joseph. The link was not identified immediately. In fact, the task force did not realize the connection until after they checked the Camaro's registration, and found that it was, in fact, a Corvette. While this was taking place, the bodies continued to pile up. A local resident came across a decomposing body on November 5, 1997, in Hangman Valley Road. A shallow grave was dug around the body in an apparent attempt to conceal it. The body was found naked, but a blouse had been recovered from the grave. Upon completion of the autopsy, it was discovered that the corpse was Darla Scott, 29, who had a long history of prostitution and drug arrests. A gunshot may have been fired at Scott, and a plastic bag was found warped on Scott's head. In the meantime, another body was discovered in the state's western area, a month after the first. The Tacoma Police Department responded on December 7, 1997, to a report that a body had been found in Adams Street in Tacoma, Washington. The body was found nude, partially obscured by brush. It was believed that the victim's clothes were strewn over her body, and she had plastic bags covering her head. A casing from a .25 caliber spent shell was also found at the scene. Upon further examination of the body, it was discovered to be 34-year-old, Melinda Mercer. Mercer had a history of prostitution and drug abuse. She died of gunshot wounds to the head. A second body was found on December 17, 1997, in the same area of Spokane where Scott's body had been found in November. The body of the woman, who was fully clothed, but had plastic bags tied around her head, was thrown over the side of a steep embankment. Where it fell down the slope, and came to rest about 25 feet away from the edge of the road. Sean Johnson, 36 was later identified as the body found in the creek and she had been shot multiple times. The mummy was processed for evidence, and many items were recovered, including hairs and fibers. Sadly the bodies of two more Caucasian females were found the day after Christmas, on December 26, 1997. The two bodies found this time was fully clothed, except for missing their shoes. However, such was not the case with many other corpses. Both bodies were covered with dead plant matter. The two victims have been identified as Laurel Wasson, 31, and Sean McLenahan, 39. Each of the victims had three plastic bags covering their heads, and an autopsy determined that they had been shot to death. Investigators don't make any progress, but they only collect bodies. Sonny Oster 41, found February 8, 1998. Her remains are found in a wooded area in western Spokane County. Three plastic bags cover her head. The cause of death is two gunshots to the head. 
In April 1998, Linda Mabin's body was found near Wasson's and McLenahan's discovery two months earlier. Like Wasson and McLenahan, Mabin's body was covered in vegetation that did not grow in the area. This helps support the investigation's theory that the plant material may have come from the killer's home. It was found that Mabin's body was fully clothed and plastic bags on her head. She also had been badly decomposed, and there had been animals that had disturbed her body. From the scene, it had been apparent that it had been there for some time. Further investigation revealed that Mabin had an extensive history of using illicit drugs, especially crack cocaine. Again in the early hours of Tuesday, July 7, 1998, a body of a white female was found in a vacant lot near Coastline Street in Spokane. The body was later identified as Mitchell in Durning, 47, died of gunshot wounds, and meth was found in her body as the cause of death. Her body was covered with a large amount of grass. As of Tuesday, October 13, 1998, the body of 35-year-old Connie LaFontaine, in Tacoma, Washington. When cops responded, they found that the body was badly decomposed, had three plastic bags over the head, and she had sustained a gunshot wound to the head. A 9mm caliber bullet was found, however, a follow-up investigation revealed that Connie had a small handgun capable of firing a 9mm bullet leading the investigators to believe that the bullet belonged to Connie, not her killer. Knowing his prostitution and drug usage involvement, Ellis was no different from all of his fellow victims. In light of the ongoing investigation, of multiple murdered prostitutes across several counties, clearly had ties to Spokane serial killer, who seemed to travel across the state carrying out his murders. Connie's body was linked to the Spokane serial killer's alleged murders. Which brings the official count to 17 bodies, and many uncounted others may have been linked to him, but still remain unsolved. Now the evidence collected regarding the cases of Nikki and Kathy strongly indicated the two cases were indeed related. The same weapon used in the killings of Lowe and Brisbois was most likely a handgun. And when the crime lab examined the ballistic evidence in Patricia's case, it found bullets in her body had been too badly damaged after passing through muscles and bones. Also, it was ruled that the firearms evidence from the Zielinski case, wasn't adequate compared to bullet fragments recovered from other victims. It was determined that Zielinski had been shot with a semi-automatic pistol, and the bullets recovered from Zielinski's body, were manufactured by a brand called, Magtech which had limited availability within Illinois. It appears that the firearms evidence in the Hernandez, Wasson, Mabin, had been shot with most likely a semi-automatic pistol. Comparing the ballistics of the bullets recovered from each case, indicated that all had come from the same gun. In comparison of firearms evidence from Mercer and other cases, Mercer and Durning were killed by bullets fired from the same weapon, indicating both were killed by bullets from the same .25 caliber. But the evidence linking those two cases bore only similarities, and it wasn't conclusively shown that bullets from the same gun killed both women. Human sperm was found in the orifices and cavities of Scott, Johnson, Wasson, McLenahan, Mercer, Durning, and Oster, and the condom recovered from Mabin, during autopsies. The DNA evidence of the sperm pointed to a single individual. On top, each victim should have had some money at the time of their death since prostitutes are normally paid in advance. So it appears they were robbed before, or after the murders. As they had been doing for some time now, the Spokane Serial Killer Task Force was out in numbers on November 10, 1998. In less than a month since Connie was killed on the other side of the state, cops knew it was only a matter of time before he struck again. Indeed, it was 1.20 a.m., on First and Crest Line, officers observed a man driving a silver 1985 Honda Civic to pull over and pick up a known prostitute, Jennifer Robinson. This was the second encounter the task force had with Robert Yates during its investigation. Yates told the police officer he had been instructed by Jennifer's father, to drive to the area, find Jennifer, and bring her home. As Robinson acknowledged knowing Yates, there was little he could do. 
So, having been unable to arrest either of them, the officer took a field report, which reached the task force. At the time, Robinson didn't realize how lucky she was. The task force detectives became aware of a report on August 1, 1998, as the investigation into the prostitute murders neared 1999. The report said Christine Smith, 30, was robbed and assaulted while working as a prostitute on East Sprague. Smith told the police she was being picked up by a date in a black 70s model van with orange exterior paint. A wood-framed bed with a mattress sat in the back, with dark brown vinyl seats. It was described as a white man, approximately 50 years old, 5 feet 10 inches tall, 175 pounds, sandy blonde hair, and no sign of nervousness or alcohol use. After negotiating a price, she told him to park behind Fifth Street Clinic. He told her he was a helicopter pilot with the National Guard en route to the location. She had asked the man if he was the psycho killer, and he replied, he wasn't. He told her he had five children and would not do that. The man gave her $40 for oral sex in the parking lot. On the raised mattress at the van's rear, they performed oral sex for seven minutes. He remained erect the entire time, she said. After seven minutes, he hit her over the head with something. She almost lost consciousness. Then she fell backward. The man told her to return his money. To her horror, she couldn't find the handle to the sliding side door. She started making her way to the van's front during that time. The woman, bleeding profusely from her head, managed to make it to the front seat area, and out of the passenger door. As Smith fled for her life, she managed to make it to nearby rehabilitation center, where she received help from a security guard. And as soon as she left, she contacted the police and detailed what had happened to her. As the investigation progressed from day to day, and month to month, the task force detectives became more and more convinced, that Yates was the man responsible for the crime. He fit the general description of the suspect who had attacked Smith, right down to the pockmarked face, his clothes, and the fact that he drove a white Corvette, and a Honda Civic. They also learned that he was a member of the Washington National Guard, and served in the capacity of a helicopter pilot. One of the detectives from the task force paid a visit to the Yates home in Spokane, on September 14, 1999. Yates wasn't at home, so detective left a message for Yates to contact as soon as possible. Yates complied and contacted them, then arrangements were made for them to meet. In the hotel's lobby, detectives greeted Yates and brought him into an interrogation room, they informed him that his name had surfaced with the serial murder investigation. He was not considered a suspect at that point, that he didn't have to answer any questions and that he was free to leave at any time. Yates agreed that he understood the situation. The first question Yates was asked was about the contact he had made with the girl and the police on November 10, 1998. Yates basically repeated the same story, he had been instructed to pick her up by her father. Still, Yates remained committed to the story. When asked to recall the girl's name, he could not recall it, but he believed that her name was Jennifer. When asked what her father's name, he could not remember. Upon being asked how he knew Jennifer's father, he said that the two had worked together briefly. Continuing his response to their questions, Yates said he had driven the young woman to her home, located two blocks from Mission Avenue. Detectives told Yates they did not believe his story bluntly. Acts of prostitution, drugs, and other minor offenses are not important to their inquiry. If he admitted to such acts, he would not face any consequences. The investigators also reminded him that the impetus of their investigation was about the murders, and that lying to them would only raise suspicions. He insisted he was telling the truth, when they pointed out that he could contact Jennifer's father and check his story. As he returned to work at patrol on East Riverside in Spokane, he owned the white Corvette but sold it to a friend. When asked about any other vehicles he drove or owned, Yates said he owned a silver 1985 Honda Civic. He said he had access to vehicles at work but drove them sparingly and never took them home. Next, 
They asked if he had been in contact with prostitutes. He said he had not been involved with any other prostitutes in Spokane. Still, while serving in Germany, he hired yes. Detectives asked him to provide his blood sample to eliminate himself as a suspect. He said after talking with his wife, he would call them with his decision. After leaving the building, he called back to say, he would not provide the requested blood sample. Jennifer Robinson was contacted the day after Yates met with detectives from the task force. As she told investigators, she remembered the Yates and police incident. She explained that she and Yates had agreed to perform oral sex for him for $20. As soon as the police stopped them, she instructed Yates to tell them the story about her father, which she said wasn't true. Her father didn't live in Spokane, and he had never worked with Yates. Having determined that Yates lied to them, the detectives considered him an even stronger suspect in the murders. It was decided to contact the friend, Yates had sold the white Corvette to. The current Corvette owner said she purchased it from Yates in May 1998. Yates owned the Corvette between September 1994 and May 1998. During questioning, the new owner said, Yates told her he had changed the car's carpet a year earlier. Yates owned the Corvette for two years, during which the carpet was changed twice. This was unusual unless the carpet was damaged or stained. During the search of the vehicle, several fiber samples were taken from numerous locations in the vehicle. Yates owned several vehicles while in patrol's employ, including a mid-80s model Ford pickup, perhaps a 4x4, and a van. Yates obtained the van two to three months before his encounter with Christine Smith, who escaped in August 1998. Christine described her attacker as driving the same van. During his interview with the task force detectives, Yates failed to mention either of these vehicles. They puzzled. Investigators from the task force learned on April 5, 2000, that the fibers recovered from the Corvette closely matched those recovered during the Jennifer Joseph murder investigation. The task force believes that additional evidence about the murder of Joseph may be found inside the Corvette, so it impounded the vehicle for further testing. On the passenger side of the floorboard, they noted a white button, and they found the seat belt buckle, and attaching device stained with blood. Several areas of both the driver's and passenger's seats were swabbed and tested chemically for blood, and the tests were positive. They also found traces of dried blood and blood stains on the bottom of the passenger seat and several stains on the passenger side floorboard. DNA was extracted from three stains that responded to a chemical test for blood. It was determined that the blood was from the same person. Jennifer Joseph's blood samples were taken from her parents, and DNA was extracted. Blood samples from Joseph's parents, and blood stains found inside the Corvette closely matched. Also, the detectives found that the white button inside the Corvette, made from white mother of pearl, was similar to one found on Jennifer Joseph's blouse. Yates also has five children, as Christine Smith had told the detectives. Yates was the man they were looking for. Now there was no doubt about it. On April 18, 2000, Robert Lee Yates, was arrested for the killing of Jennifer Joseph. His blood samples were obtained with a search warrant executed at his arrest. DNA analysis found Yates' DNA profiles, matched those of sperm samples from Scott, Johnson, Wasson, McLenahan, Oster, Mabin, and Durning. Yates' home was also searched. They noted species of plants that were identical to the vegetation found on the bodies of Wasson, McLenahan, and Mabin. After Yates' arrest, and seeing his photo in the news, Smith contacted task force detectives again, saying it was Yates who allegedly attacked her. Smith told detectives, she had recently been treated at the University of Washington Medical Center for injuries sustained in an automobile accident. X-rays of her head determined that she carried metal fragments in her head. Doctors' reports concluded, she was likely wounded by an old gunshot to the left mastoid. She thought that he had struck her with an unidentified object on the same spot. Smith wondered whether she was shot or struck, 
because of the suddenness and severity of the attack. It was possible, even likely, that she had been mistaken about being struck. Even though she could not identify Yates from a photo lineup, she said he looked like the man who assaulted her. After Yates' arrest, detectives found and seized several vehicles, Yates previously owned, including a 1979 Ford van. Inside the van, blood marking chemicals identified numerous stains. Detection teams also found a spent Magtech.25 bullet casing used in the murder of Johnson, Wasson, McLenahan, Oster, Mabin, and Mercer. In fact, Yates, who is now 47 years old, has been charged with eight counts of first-degree murder. He was suspected of killing at least 18 women in the Spokane area, possibly even more. In connection with the assault on Christine Smith, he was also charged with attempted murder and burglary. He was held without bond, and initially denied all of the charges. In Pierce County, Yates was charged with the first-degree murders of Connie LaFontaine and Melinda Mercer. He pleaded not guilty in those murders as well. Yet, another murder had been committed by Yates, that of Melody Murfin, 43. Murfin was last seen on May 20, 1998. Yates was considered a prime suspect in her disappearance and murder, but no evidence linked Yates to Murfin. Soon, that changed. Yates, via his attorneys, announced on October 16, 2000, that he was ready to negotiate a deal despite the insurmountable evidence against him, and the almost certainty of receiving the death penalty. Yates offered to plead guilty to 13 counts of first-degree murder, and one count of attempted first-degree murder in exchange for life in prison. But not to the charges facing him in Pierce County. He also promised to lead the cops, to Melody Murphan's body. In the end, Yates agreed with the authorities and drew a map of his house yard, after agreeing to his offer's terms. They spent about two hours digging in the yard of Yates' former home, before they found what they were looking for. They found her remains buried eight inches below, one foot from Yates' bedroom window. A few weeks later, Yates kept his word and pleaded guilty, to 13 of the murders that the task force had been investigating. In the weeks leading up to the indictment, Yates claimed that he felt remorse for the crimes that he had committed. While hissing, and jeering filled the courtroom, he made the following remarks. I have taken away the love, the compassion, and the tenderness of your loved ones, and left the grief, and bitterness. I have turned to God to help me, overcome my guilt, and shame. I pray that he will replace your pain with peace. In the end, Yates was sentenced to 408 years in prison, for one of the worst murder sprees in American history. Despite this, a court ruled in 2018 that the death penalty was unconstitutional in the state. It was once thought that Yates would be executed. Still, he has now been sentenced to life without parole, at the Washington State Penitentiary, where he once served time on death row. Yates, that horrible person, took a lot of innocent souls. I am fully aware of the limitless wrong choices they have made, but that does not allow him to take a young girl's mother, and bury her in his yard. At the same time, his family walks around her mother for two and a half years. That's just evil. The man doesn't deserve to see daylight or family again. For the rest of his life, he should be tortured in prison. Thank you for watching. Be careful out there.